Rob Berthoff here with a special message, uh, really not one about fear, but definitely one about alertness. I really think it comes down to this question is, are we ready for the times that are coming? And I'll be doing a series of different videos on different topics on the same topic. This one specifically around the financial crisis that we're going into. I think the most important thing to understand is that, you know, while there are indicators that show that, oh, the economy seems good, if you really are looking, it's all smoke and mirrors. And I really recommend that you actually have a little more of an understanding of our current financial landscape. And so if I were to, to you know, say, as I did in a recent post, um, you know, you really need to start uh, considering um, you know, looking forward. And people are like, oh, but the stock market's fine. Look how it's doing. And yes, yeah, central banks, such as the Federal Reserve, use the stock market performance as a tool to manage this perception of the economy. And rising stock markets are generally perceived as a sign of a healthy, growing economy. But this is typically a distortion of the true economic conditions around these kind of, you know, leading to ultimately to these financial bubbles. What we're really seeing right now is the Federal Reserve just a bunch of spinning a bunch of plates, right? And they, they're managing to keep the stock market up, the currency up, bonds up. But ultimately what they're losing on is inflation and they're losing reputation on a global scale. And now you may say, well, no, the rep, no, they're not losing inflation. Inflation's great right now. Well, you could argue that the inflation's only increased by 3%, and it seems like everything's fine, but what you need to see is how the growth rate of wages has fallen uh, below inflation since 2021. Ultimately, what's if we look at real purchasing power, it's on a steady decline. Consumer food pricings are up 10 points over the last year. This is the biggest increase, you know, ultimately since I think 1979, when we look at the different um, uh, types of commodities that are up. This is this idea that even for the ones that are, um, are, are not up, this, you know, the prices doesn't look like they've changed. What we see is shrinkflation. And this is a form of hidden inflation. And this term, this coin was termed with this idea around how we're, we're essentially paying the same amount of money but we're getting less in the product. So it doesn't even seem like there's inflation because, oh no, that, that bag still costs the same amount of money as it did before. But what's happening is that if you actually look at per ounce, uh, it's, it's just steadily increasing. So ultimately, while you know, we're you know, being reassured that everything's fine, we need to you know, kind of, you know, and, and, and by the way, they're using this kind of, this volatility index, right? They're using this to you know, try and keep us this idea, that, no, look, everything's good. But We've got to look to, you know, deeper, right? Because these are ultimately misleading economic indicators. What I think is interesting is how there's this relationship. Well, as uh, you know, kind of as um, Harvard puts it, a curious uh, relationship uh, between oil and our GDP. And if you go through this, every country has the same. It's a direct correlation between oil consumption and, and a nation's GDP. So when we kind of look at that. We can understand that you know while there is uh, while we're while we're you know consuming oil, uh, we're going to be good, and understand that you know oil is needed for the economic activity, and it's more than just trains and trucks and automobiles. About thirty percent is used for things like petrochemicals. You know, it's the plastics, the pharmaceuticals. I mean, there's so much uh, that goes. So much of our system is around oil. It's not just for for um, gasoline. And so again, it goes back to this idea of, you know, we need to understand that if we we need access to oil if we want to stay afloat, right? This shows that our economy is based on oil consumption. And when we look at these charts, it's interesting. We can see that one of the ways that we've been able to stabilize our economy is through oil production. And after the last recession, we've pulled out essentially, you know, by leaning on tight oil or essentially the, 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 the shale oil that we get from fracking. But this takes a huge dip. What we see is where we're at right now, the lightest numbers in 2023, the, the part past that is a prediction. Um, but ultimately what we need to understand is that, you know, it's here in a, an article from Bloomberg, is that shale wells are being depleted faster than expected. And so this is this idea of, um, you know, understanding that you know, 
that, that it's not, it's not going to last forever. Now I'm not getting into this idea of peak oil. I'm not even talking about peak oil, which is the idea that eventually all the oil will drain. I'm not talking about that. There's still tons of oil out there. Okay. What I'm trying to say is, is that there needs to be a continual uh, grabbing of this, right? And when we see the countries that have the highest amount of oil reserves, all of a sudden some stuff starts to make sense. There are some countries that the U.S. has no interest in. And there are other countries the U.S. has a lot of interest in. What's, you know, basic pattern matching is we can actually see that, you notice these list of names. The U.S. is number 10, right? Above them, Libya. Who do we see there? Russia, Iraq, Kuwait, Iran, Venezuela, right? So Libya, right, it, you know, uh, comes out that we, we, we were... You know, we've been attacking Libya for, for years. Uh, I think it was uh, 2015 to 2019 was the most recent, uh, attack, you know, uh, you know a takeover that we did there. But, you know, leaked emails from back with Hillary Clinton revealed that, you know, they were trying to uh, prevent Gaddafi from unifying Africa and introducing the golden, the African gold dinar, dinar, right? So we'll get into that later, this idea of the money situation. But ultimately what we see is the U.S. now has their hands on Libyan oil uh, revenues. Interestingly enough, the same thing for Iraq. It's no longer a secret that weapons of mass destruction was a lie. We went in to claim their oil fields, right? And we the same reason we took Kuwait over. I was I was in Kuwait in I don't know what year it was, 2001, I guess with the military, 2000. No, it was in 2000 with the military. Uh and and, and it was known we're there to to take over oil fields, right? What's interesting is that now when we start looking at today's news, right? We see how we want to overthrow Iran because it's oil. Right again, Iran, if we go back to it, Iran has the third largest amount of oil that there is. Right? And it's pretty interesting that the US has either defeated the top oil producing countries, that's Libya, Kuwait, Iraq. We defeated them, we own them. Okay. Or we're actively fighting against them. So who are we at Rus who are we at war with right now? Well, Russia through our Ukrainian proxy. Iran through our Israeli proxy, well, it's in, actually, in, in quite honestly, we are the proxy of Israel. I mean, they, they run our economy. We, we, we aren't running them. But the point simply is here is that we, they're either our allies, we've conquered them, or we're in the process of conquering them. And you may say, well, what about Venezuela? We haven't done that. Literally a couple days ago, on the 18th, okay? It just means you're not paying attention if you're not seeing this. On the 18th, we imposed new sanctions against Venezuela. And we use some some oh, election concern thing. It has nothing to do with that. We're sending economic hitmen to destroy Venezuela so we can get their their oil. And and again, this is this is what we're doing uh, above board with economic hitmen. But we also are sending actual hitmen. We have been trying to kill the CIA has been trying to kill um, uh, Maduro for years. In fact. This guy's got nine lives. We've sent drones over. We've sent everything we could to kill these to kill him. Somehow he keeps living. Okay, but it is we're trying to get that country as well. And not only do we want to overthrow Venezuela for the oil, but we also want to disprove socialism. And I think it's so interesting is that when countries are 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 backed with oil, meaning that they've they've not privatized the oil, it's actually a public thing. We see how uh, pre previous to um, to Maduro. With Chavez set up pretty amazing social programs and showed how it should be. Now, it wasn't perfect, right? You can point poke a lot of holes, but I think what's 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 so clear is that they had access to everything, all of the public services they need because they were they were doing it through the sales of oil. What do we do? Do we take any of the proceeds from oil? No, we put it. You give it to the national guys. So somehow. We have allowed the resources below our feet to be taken from us and put in the hands of the mega, mega rich. Okay, It's bizarre how much money these companies are making and none of that's going back to us because they're all offshore. It's so bizarre. And so, again, we, we understand that going back to this concept that um, it was a bit of a tangent, but to recap, the only way we're going to stay afloat is through wars and controlling the global uh, oil supply. That's how we, we we're, that's how the the dollar has been propped up for this many years. J.P. Morgan, however, predicts that in 2025 we will face an oil supply deficit, which will balloon by 2030. And so, again, remember that relationship, and remember what we have here. 
J.P. Morgan says by 2025, which is a couple months from now, right, next year, we're going to have a, a supply and demand issue. There's going to be uh, less uh, supply to meet the demand. And so that's so interesting is that it's already going down. And, and again, remember, there's a direct correlation between oil consumption and financial health for us as a country. So when the deficit goes down next year, right, and balloons by 2030, where's the impact? Where's the, where's the, the shortfall going to come from? Now, again, it's not just oil. There are other warning signs, right? And this takes this next concept, you know, is last month, the chief of the Federal Reserve had an interview with 60 Minutes, and he said that the federal government is accumulating debt faster than the economy is growing, okay? He testified to law lawmakers that the U.S. is on an unsustainable fiscal path. So this is the guy in charge, right? And he's saying that it's, uh, it's unsustainable, pretty heavy. And when we look at the national debt, right, we're at 34 trillion. That's a T, trillion with a capital T. 34 trillion. And it's growing by about 1 trillion every 100 days. So it's just out of control growth right now, out of control debt. We're just printing money, right? And and it's it's not so much, it's not even the fact that we owe that money, but this is not money that's just, that we're sitting on. We're, we ironic somehow, somehow we put ourselves in a position where we don't even control our own money. It's actually controlled by the Federal Reserve. So the Federal Reserve, which has nothing to do with the government, it's actually not connected to the U.S. government, is loaning us money, but they're loaning us money not based on gold. They're loaning us money based on nothing. So they're printing money out of thin air and then charging us interest on money that they've printed out of thin air. And so our interest is now going to be one trillion per year, and that equates to about seventy per two percent of your income taxes. Those that just filed income taxes in the United States, seventy-two cents on that dollar went to just pay on the interest. It's kind of like buying a home, and you're not paying anything on the principal; you're just paying on the interest. And so, what's so crazy is that we're printing money like it's going out of style, right? And there's got to be a reason for that. Like, why is that we've been so generous? You know, this weekend, literally just two days ago, the the uh, Congress came in on a Saturday, which, by the way, was Hitler's birthday. No less, uh, you know, little 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 symbolism there. They come in on Hitler's birthday to pass a bill to give ninety five billion dollars to Ukraine and Israel. Okay, but but what's crazy about that is that is that ninety five billion, about sixty one billion of that was for was for. Um, uh, Ukraine, we'd already given them 68 billion, right? So of that 68 billion plus another 61 billion to Ukraine, very, very little is to humanitarian, almost all of it's to military. So it's interesting that the money's not actually even going to the Ukraine, right? The money is going to defense contractors. So we're not actually giving the money to them for any like, you know, humanitarian reason. We're just pumping the money in through. So it, it's it's money laundering, okay? And these, uh, you know, um, these um, the, 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 what, what we're buying is incredibly overpriced. I remember back in the day, this was when I was in when the Air Force, we were paying like $70 for a, you know, a, a $5 hammer, paying $70. We we're paying like crazy amount of money for every rivet on the plane it was super expensive, right? And it's interesting how in 91, a, a missile, the same exact missile, was uh, twenty five thousand is now four hundred thousand, so something that that cost twenty five thousand dollars is now costing four hundred thousand dollars. So if you get the sense of this, taxpayers are giving their money to the IRS, which you can talk about the legality of that. I'm not going to get into it. They're also giving their children to war, by the way. Okay, so then the IRS, the politicians are influencing that money to go into funding to buying weapons for foreign countries. But most of that money is not even going to the foreign country. That money is actually going back into these corporate thieves, these defense contractors. And they're now bought bribing the politicians to keep this thing moving, right? And then that the conquered lands then give us oil, which also goes back into the corporate thieves. So it's just so interesting. This whole cycle is, is there to benefit the war profiteering, the, the, the criminals. These are, these are criminals. What they're doing is 
they're, they're, they're stealing money from the U.S. government. It's, it's a money laundering scheme. But it's not just the defense contractors. It's also the politicians. How is it that the politicians come in with less than a million dollar net worth and then have multi-million dollar net worth on, on a salary that should not support that? Nancy Pelosi is making 175000 a year. And yet, from, from, from Congress, and yet, uh, or a Senate, and yet uh, her net worth is 120 billion, a million. So how does that add up? Well, the money comes from insider trading, which she's doing, from kickbacks, from, from lobbyists. We've, we've reached a state, and again, this is not just one side, it's both sides of the aisle. We've reached a state where we're no longer a democracy. In fact, I would say that we're no longer even a functioning society. While it has not yet collapsed, it's getting very close. As Karl Marx's theory of social institutional transformation in late-stage capitalism puts it, we are ultimately in a space where it's a money-grabbing scheme, and they're just grabbing money, right? This is in the, in the crypto space, this would be the pump and dump, right? The U.S. economy is in a massive pump and dump, and they know what's, it's over. They know that the economy is over. They're propping it up. They're now just driving, they're just printing money like it's going out of style and just pulling as much money out of the U.S. economy as they can before they pull the rug out on us. The U.S. dollar is dead. Now, it, it's, you know, it's, it's clinging on out, from out of the grave somehow. But if we were to just take a step back and really look at what's happening, we see that over the last five years, the U.S. dollar has lost 50% value to the Japanese yuan. It's lost 10% value to the Chinese yuan over the last two years. And if we were to look at a macro view, let's say 10 years, against uh, Russia, it's lost a significant amount. And even through sanctions, they have that. And so ultimately what we have to understand is that, you know, these different, you know, China, Russia, they're coming together. And combine them with Brazil, India, South Africa, and, and more, they're all coming together to create a new global reserve currency. And rumor has it, it's going to come out this year. It could come out as, as early as this fall. Okay, It could come out later than that, but there's, there's rumors that come out earlier. So ultimately what to understand is that the U.S. dollar is not always going to be the default currency. I believe that we have potentially a few years left, maximum, um, two years maybe, three years maximum. But what that understand is that, you know, we really have to see that that even though all the indicators are there, right, but but they're holding on because they know Trump's going to be elected. And the Trump is very, very good to, to you know, with, with, with this whole pumping the currency stuff up, you know. It's not just the Democrats that are doing it right now. The, the Republicans do it just as much. And so, you know, I think it's going to hold on through a, a, a Trump presidency. I think once Trump gets assassinated, the whole thing is going to fall apart. But uh, anyways, ultimately this. The question is, how do we prepare for this financial crisis? And the first thing we need to understand, and, and I'm not going to cover much of this. I'm going to finish. I'm going to do this part quickly because um, I already have another video on this. But the first thing we understand is we've got to better understand what wealth is. Because it feels like too many of us have been bought into the lie of this imaginary wealth or this intangible wealth, right? So if we were to think of it as a pyramid, at the very, very top of the pyramid is the intangible wealth. And this is the fiat currency. It's the stocks and bonds. But their only value is based on trust. Because again, we've moved off the gold standard. It's, it's fiat. It's only based on trust. There's no inherent value of its own. To prove this, imagine yourself on a desert island. And you're given this, this magical chest, right? What do you want it full of? Right. What would you ask for? You can put anything you want in your in your magical chest on this desert island. Do you ask for it to be full of money? Do you ask for it to be full of gold? No. It would do no good for you. Right? You would want it to be filled with something practical that you can use. And and this is the second uh, tier, right? The secondary tier in the <clears throat> in the in the pyramid. And this is ultimately your manufactured goods, right? It's a house to stay in. It's a vehicle to use, food to eat, you know, materials to work with, right? That's what you would want in your desert island. <clears throat> and so we need to start thinking about how do we start smartly transitioning our intangible wealth, right? 
but not just into manufactured goods. We got to go deeper because you can have a tractor, but what good is a tractor without land to work? And so we need to be thinking about real assets, right? This is the foundation of the pyramid. Okay. Again, we need to be thinking about, you know, what are the, um, you know, what, what are these primary wealth, um, you know, uh, resources? It's access to timber, you know, it's access to water, it's access to, you know, it, it's, it's, it's having a garden. And so you need land to do that. And so, you know, there needs to be a focus on getting land, right? Uh, the price is only going to go up, uh, you, know, you know, building a garden, you know, creating a garden, you know, um, you know planting trees if you, if you need, planting resources, bamboo, whatever it is that you think you're going to need, right? Ensuring you have good sources of water on that land. And then from that, use that to make manufactured, you know, to, 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 to create food for yourself, to create raw materials for yourself, right? Put your house on that, you know, and then ultimately, again, you, you work up the ladder. So if you don't have the bottom piece of the ladder, the top part of the ladder will do you no good. This is why it's just so bizarre to me. People are like, I'm going to put my money into crypto. That's, that's even stupider than, than cash at this point. Okay. The point is this, is that take your money out of that, right? Focus on real assets, Right? not on accumulating this non you know non in, uh, in, this intangible wealth again if you want the real focus again this is this is a very this is a very worldly mindset kind of uh, you know secular mindset video I'm putting out right now uh, but if you really want the real advice it's remember to put God first because he's going to give you all this if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness he's going to give you all this stuff right but but for the purpose of, of my you know secular friends watching this, the idea simply is convert your crypto and fiat currency into real assets. And this is then how you will generate wealth. Okay. And again, never use money to measure wealth. Okay. What you got to use wealth to understand what wealth is. And again, I've already created a video on this, but to understand what wealth is, wealth is a product of land that's transformed by labor and capital to satisfy human desires. So again, when we start looking at that, you need the land. You need to have the skills. You need to be investing in skills because labor requires intelligent labor, requires the ability to do things. And then from that, you can then actually create capital. So in short, it's this kind of this, you know, land is a natural resource, right? You can leverage it, exploit it, right? Labor is a human exertion, right? Be it your own or your employees, right? And capital is anything like building a machinery, other inventory, right? So ultimately, you know, another way to look at it is, you know, you are the labor, right? You're on your tractor, which is your capital. You're working your land to harvest a crop that you can sell, generates income, right? And if while doing this, you think of a better way to harvest that crop, you can start a company offering a product and, you know, develop an enterprise. And so that's kind of the idea of, 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 of the sickle. And again, I've talked about this already. I'm not going to talk more about it in this, in, this, in, this, uh, in this video. I'll keep this video short. But the idea is you can find my video on community models. I'll talk all about that. Um, but this is kind of a follow-up video from a post I put on Facebook that, um, you know, people just, I, I thought more people got it, but what became clear is most people don't get it. And so again, my advice to keep it simple is pray that God opens up a door to get land because it's his will that you live as you, as he intended for you to live, which is in a country setting where your reliance is on him and not on industrialized systems Two, pay attention, stop consuming this mindless media media. Stop believing that everything is okay. You're being fed a lie by the people that are pulling it all out of your pockets, right? They're, they're, they're draining you, telling you everything is fine, and then all of a sudden it won't be, okay? So don't be caught when the music stops. Pay attention to the signs. Don't panic. You actually have time, but this is probably your final warning that you're going to get. You have a little bit of time. Get some land. Learn some skills. Build, you know, create a garden, right? You've got time but you don't have much time. Don't panic. Keep a calm head, right? Start being more aware of what you're consuming, where it's coming from. Make relationships with neighbors, bartering goods and services. Think about what you need. Stop thinking through the lens of industrialized supply chains. Start building a support network community. Even consider communal living, even. Again, don't panic. Start small, but start now, this could mean converting your lawn to a garden. It could mean just, you know, learning how to grow in a container in your balcony. Do something that will allow you to be more self-sufficient. Start now. 
But fear not, because God is with you. And don't be dismayed, for he is your God. He will strengthen you. He will help you. He will uphold you at the right hand of his righteousness. You've got to put your faith in God, not on your own supply chain. But there's also a part that we need to do for ourselves. And so I just pray that God is awakening you right now. I, ha- I hope that, uh, I just ask God, Lord, please be with the people that are here this message. Help them put their faith in you. Help them understand that even their best preparation will do nothing if they haven't also prepared for the storm that's coming spiritually. Lord, I just ask that they put their faith in you. They grow closer to you. They see their need for you. I ask, Lord, that you reach out to them and help them see that you've you've got them covered. Help them not to feel any anxiety. Help them to, to understand that you are with them. But also help them understand that judgments are coming on the cities and they need to get out of the city. You've told us that in Revelation 14. The second angel's message is very clear to come out of Babylon. That means physical and that means spiritual. So, Lord, I just ask you to impress it upon their hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.